Hi everybody, I'm Jeremy Rorty. I'm Joshua Rorty. We're the principal instructors of Rising Phoenix Martial Arts. However, we're also the writers, editors, voice actors, um, whatever, whole production, whole production team for the Warriors Path story that we've been presenting the last few weeks on YouTube. And we just wanted to give a little comment, commentary on where the story came from, how it developed to be where it's at right now. So let's start from the beginning, where it came from. You know, ever since we were young, we've been very interested in Dungeons and Dragons. It's a really cool game where it uses your imagination and develops your storytelling abilities. Uh, one time we had one of our friends uh, up here living uh, near us, and his son and daughter came up to visit him. We were all going to go out camping. They'd never really been out camping before. What do you do when you're camping? You tell, you tell stories around the campfire. So we just kind of came up with a story to entertain them over the course of the three days or so that we were going to be up there camping. And then it just kind of grew from there. It happened to be right at the beginning of the summer, and then we had our Kids Unlimited summer camp coming up. And so we had this idea of, hey, why don't we develop this story a little bit more to encompass our Warriors Pledge that we tell with every class and have those elements in this story, which they were pretty much mostly there anyhow. But just taking the story apart again and putting it back together to come up with something a little better. We actually sat down and finalized the story, wrote it into a book format. If you guys are interested, put a comment down below and I can put a uh, download link for the book so you can read the book too. So we had the book format and we would use that with stories to tell not only to the summer camp but our regular students. And it gave a great visual and great storyline that really helped. Uh, personify that warrior's pledge. They got to see these two children take these two different paths toward the warrior. In a very illustrative form, which I think is important for some of the younger elementary school kids that we're talking about these very heady concepts with. If you can illustrate it, their brains pick it up and they instantly understand exactly what the tenet was all about. Now, when we were kids, our mom was the one who got us into D&D. However, part of that was when we were even younger, she had pastel drawings that she had made of the Lord of the Rings books and all laid out in this great big folder. And a lot of people know of her mom as being an awesome musician and artistic that way. Not a lot of people know our mom for her actual drawing ability. But we would sit there at bedtime and she'd read the book and my brother and I would be able to sit there and flip through these pastel drawings. There were um, uh, posters from calendars that we also completed that. So it really kind of helped form this visual in your head and helped add to your imagination. And so we decided we needed to do that with this story. So we just uh, decided to do one more finalization over the story. And as we went through it, we kind of grew some parts of it and then figured out what kind of pictures would help tell the story. You know what they say? Pictures say a thousand words. Well, in this case, it not only says a thousand words, but it also draws you into being one of the characters of the story itself. Now, in this story, we're highlighting two of the, the first two tenets of the Warriors Pledge, which is courtesy and modesty. So as you go through this first chapter, then you take a look and see where you see those elements. But we define courtesy as treating others how you want to be treated. Things like please and thank you, holding the door for people when you see they need help. Modesty is always considering other people first. They're more, if you can consider them being more important, you're putting them first, just like a mother would do for her child. It's a matter of not bragging all the time, but trying to just be helpful to everybody around you. So again, look through the story, see if you can come up with examples of those two tenets throughout the story. Also, you're going to see every chapter we have some martial arts training in it. Rewatch this uh, whole chapter and see if you can figure out what was the martial concept in this chapter. And then on top of that, there's a, a game. One Now, all the games that are being played within the story in each chapter are all very popular games that we have through our dojo. We like to have games that teach martial arts at the same time that the kids are playing. They don't realize they're training. So feel free to leave a comment below on what you think the training aspects were, what you think were the things that pointed to courtesy and modesty, and then leave a like and subscribe that we'll be coming out with them.
chapter two here in the next couple of weeks. Deep in the heart of a forest lies a small village. Despite its size, the town is bustling with activity. The clang of a blacksmith's hammer punctuates a rhythm to the hum of voices, bartering and discussing events of the week. Throughout the village, errant roads wind through the trees past a few cats lazing in scattered sunspots. At the market, a dog barks at a food stand and wags its tail, doing tricks for scraps. In a grassy clearing at the edge of the forest, two children are playing with a ball, hitting it back and forth with their hands and feet. The larger, dark-haired boy kicks the ball over the little girl's head. Her mop of red hair bounces as she chases it into the forest. A dark stranger steps out from the shadows of the forest. Sunlight reflects from his blade as he cuts the ball out of the air, leaving it in two halves laying on the ground. As the man hides his blade back in his dark cloak, he scolds the children. You brats should watch who you throw things at. He then pushes past the children and strides boldly into the village. A thin man in tattered clothing approaches him. Please, sir, do you have anything to spare a poor hungry soul? He asks, holding out a small bowl. Ha ha ha! The stranger laughs and snatches the bowl from the beggar's hands. I've come to collect a tribute from this town, not to pay it. He takes the handful of coins from the bowl and then hands it back so forcefully that the beggar hits the ground with a solid thud. Oh. Just then, an old woman walks by, arms laden with bags full of food. Old woman, I'm hungry and here to collect tribute for protecting you this day. Give me your food. This food is for my grandchildren. They will go hungry if I don't bring it home. Besides, I don't need protecting. Foolish old lady, you need protection from me! The dark figure kicks the woman's feet out from under her. She lands hard on her backside, scattering food across the street like dice being tossed. Laughing, the dark figure picks up an apple and takes a greedy bite. From a nearby building, an old man, aided by a walking stick, approaches the woman. He helps her to her feet, then begins loading food back into the bags. Old man, that's my food now. Stay out of this or soon you'll need protection. The stranger screams with bits of apple spraying from his mouth. The old man's voice creaks like an unoiled hinge. You should help those weaker than you, not harm them. You will find that if you are courteous, we can be generous. Fool, do you know who I am? The dark figure charges at the old man, sword flashing from his cloak. The old man deftly turns away from the strike, deflecting the blade with his walking stick and sending it flying into the bushy forest. He then extends his leg, kicking the stranger's feet out from underneath him. The stranger lands flat on his back with the wind knocked out of him. Ugh. The dark figure struggles to his feet, trying to catch his breath. He looks down in disbelief at his empty hand and flees back into the forest, but not before receiving several welts on his backside from the old man's cane. The young boy rushes up to the master, unable to contain his excitement. That was amazing! Can you teach me to fight like that? The young girl stoops down and picks up a bag. You're a hero, master. I would love to one day protect a village like you. Would you teach us? I could train you, but first you must prove that you are worthy of such training. Meet me at my home before the break of dawn. I live at the top of the tallest mountain on the north side of the village. The children help gather the groceries and carry the overloaded bags back to the old lady's home. Thank you, Mr. Adoy. You and the children have been so helpful. Won't you all come in and have some pie? They eat their fill of pie and head back toward the village square. Before they part ways, Mr. Adoy reminds them, Turn in early tonight. On the mountain, the sun rises earlier than you might expect. He then collects his oxen cart, leading them on the road out of the village. Hey, Luna, I know where we can find a new ball. Let's go get it. Well, I have some chores that need finishing before dark, 
Besides, Corbat, you know how hard it is for you to wake up. The master said we need to be at his house before dawn. You should go to bed early, too. Don't worry about me. I'll wake you up. As the two part ways, Launa can't help but think. Yeah, right. I'll be the one waking you up. The dancing flicker of Luna's candle chases away the darkness. She had drank a lot of water the night before, a trick her grandpa had taught her if she needed to wake up before the sun. After loading her pillowcase with supplies for the day's journey, she sets out to Corbat's house, hoisting the sack over one shoulder. The streets are lonely as she approaches the front door of the darkened house. I knew it. He overslept again. She reaches for the door, but stops suddenly when a loud snarl erupts from the other side. Oh no! A bear's intruding and eaten them. Pushing the fear into the back of her mind, she slowly opens the door and peers into the darkness. Inside, she sees Corbin still asleep in his bed, snoring loud enough to wake a step. Gently, Launa shakes him. Wake up, Corbat. We've got to be at the master's house before dawn. The boy rubs the sleep from his eyes. Yeah, I was up earlier, but you were still asleep, so I came back home and went to bed. I don't believe you. Look, you haven't even prepared for the trip. She helps him gather some food and water and then hurries him out the door. They travel through the darkness and deep into the forest of the steep. The sounds of the night providing a musical accompaniment to their journey. Up ahead, Laguna sees a shadow moving in the distance as something skitters across the path. Did you hear that? What was that? Oh, don't worry, Corbat. It's probably just a rabbit out hunting early for its breakfast. As Corbat's legs begin to tire, he complains. I should be in my nice warm bed right now. He is interrupted by the rustling of the branches up above them. It's just me, Corbat. Who are you? I already told you who I am. Now identify yourself. Corbat, stop being silly. It's just some old owl. Hurry up or we're going to be late. As the black sky lightens to gray and their legs become heavy with fatigue, Corbat is startled by the sound of the growl. It's a bear. It's going to eat us. Corbat, that growl's just your empty stomach because you didn't wake up early enough to eat breakfast. Here, I brought snacks. How much further is it to Mr. Adoy's place anyway? I think we're lost. It can't be far now, Corbat. I can see the sky and it's growing brighter. The master said that he'd train us if we got there before the sun came up. I think if we push on, we just might make it. They push on into the waning darkness. As the sun peaks its face above the horizon, the children come upon a large field. In the distance, they can see Mr. Adoy yoking his ox to its cart. Corbat falls to his knees in despair. All that effort for nothing. We're too late. We're not too late. The sun's not all the way up, and look, the master's not even on his cart. Come on, Corbat, I'll race you. Laona is off in a flash, deftly dodging large rocks, making her way across the field to the master. You could never beat me in a foot race, Laona. You're going to need that head start. Using the strength of his legs and the length of his stride to his advantage, he hurdles each obstacle, making a straight line to the master. Looking back, Launa notices Corbat overtaking her. Mimicking his strategy, she leaps over the next rock in her path, gaining some confidence. As she looks ahead, she sees a large boulder laying in her path and thinks to herself, I can make that one too. However, the effort of her short legs were not as strong as her confidence, as her toe catches the tip of the stone, sending her hurtling through the air and landing face first in the dirt. Corbat taunts her as he passes. Ha <laughs> You've always been so clumsy. That's why you could never beat me! Laona winces in pain as she wipes the blood from her knee. Ignoring the burning in her muscles and the pounding in her chest, she pushes herself to her feet, forcing her body to respond to her will. She takes off after Corbat in a desperate attempt to regain her lead. The boy is the first one to reach Mr. Adoy. Hey, old man, where are you going? I thought you were going to train us today. The dawn is gone, and the early bird has already returned to its nest. Master, we worked so hard to get here, and the sun's not all the way up. Please, is there some way we can prove ourselves? 
I can see the sweat upon your brow, and your will is strong. If you are really willing to prove yourself, I do have one more task that you could help with. At the top of the mountain, the early morning sun warms the rock-strewn field. Stroking his beard, Master Doi examines the children from sweaty brow to bloodstained knee, observing the strength of their determination. I am headed to the market to get supplies for a garden, yet have no place to plant it. If you clear the field of every stone by the time I return from town, you will earn the right to trade with me. Looking at the innumerable heavy stones, Corbat's face turns into a scowl. We take this journey all the way from town and up this mountain, and now you want us to do your gardening? The old man's attention is turned away from Corbat's complaints as he notices the girl already wrestling a stone the size of her head. Mauna, stop! Do not hurt yourself! If you must lift a stone, use a horse dance! Demonstrating, Master Odoi lifts the knee of his right leg, swinging his right foot out and stomping the ground so hard that the vibrations can be felt beneath the children's feet. Squatting low, he grips a stone between his fingers and uses the power of his legs to rip it from the earth. I can move a much bigger rock than that. Watch this! Corbat slams his body against a boulder, his muscles straining at the attempt to roll. The stone briefly rocks, but then settles back into place, proving its weight stronger than the boy's ego. Ha ha ha! Korbak, you are like a bear cub who scratches his back upon the rock. To move a stone that large, you must use the power of a dragon's stance. Master Adoy approaches the rock and places his hands firmly on the stone. Planting one foot firmly behind him, he transfers his strength from the ground up into the stone, sending it rolling across the field. Your stance is like the roots of a tree, which reaches deep into the earth, supporting the trunk and giving strength to the branches. Master Adoy turns back to his cart, but then stops briefly as he sees the position of the sun. Shouting back over his shoulder, he advises, The day will be hot. If you need refreshment, I have left pitchers of tea and lemonade, as well as some snacks in the house. Then with little effort, Master Odoi springs into the bench of the cart. Grabbing up the reins, he gently urges the ox down towards the road to town. The sun rises high into the cloudless sky, baking the very earth. Its heat radiates off of the stones, making them almost unbearable to touch. Dripping with sweat, the boy plops onto the ground. Ugh, this day is way too hot. I tell you what, Luna, I'll go back and enjoy some of the master's refreshments. When I'm done, I'll come back and you can take a break. That's a great idea, Corbat. Then the work never has to stop. We'll be sure to clear the field before the master returns. As the boy lumbers back to the cottage, the girl continues to toil. The muscles in Luna's legs burn at the strain of moving the stones to the edge of the clearing. Noticing a cool stream running nearby, she thinks to herself, Corbat still isn't back yet? I think I'm just going to take a dip in the river and cool off. She approaches a small pool next to the river and wades in up to her waist. Dipping her head into the water to cool her flaming red hair, she notices the pile of stone diverting the water to create her swimming pool. Wow, that's neat! Maybe if I can pile some of my stones like that, I can get the water to flow to the master's garden. She begins trudging back and forth, rolling large boulders from field to stream, her efforts carving deep furrows within the earth. After countless trips with stones both large and small, a narrow arm of water begins stretching towards the field. With the fatigue of her efforts settling into her body, Laona seeks refuge beneath the canopy of a large oak tree. As she leans her back against the tree and observes her work, her eyelids grow heavy and she quickly drifts off to sleep. She is startled awake when the piece is broken by the clatter of the ox's cart. Oh no, I must have fallen asleep. I hope we moved enough stones.
The shadows of the day have grown long by the time Mr. Adoy returns from his journey to town. Approaching the field, he is pleased to see that it has been completely cleared of every stone, leaving behind furrows and mounds of dirt to plant his crops. Clicking his tongue at the ox, he pulls the cart to a clattering stop. From the high vantage point of his bench, he scans the surroundings looking for the children. Down by the river, he sees the girl gingerly rise from next to a tree and approach him with stiffness in her body. In one smooth motion, he hops off the cart to greet Lone Man. You two have accomplished more than I could have imagined in such a short time. That's not all, Master Doy. Look at what else I've done. Launa approaches a large stone at the edge of the field. Stepping forward with one foot and placing her hands on the stone, she pushes with all of her might, her muscles straining against its weight. Ha ha! Launa, I can see by the quivering of your limbs that you have pushed your body beyond its limits. He reaches his fingers into a pouch attached to his belt, removing a small green bean and presents it to her. Take this and eat it. It will help your strength return. Master Adoy, that's an awful small bean. How's that going to help? It is you who calls me master. Don't you trust me? She shrugs her shoulders and takes the bean, crushing it between her teeth. A burst of sweetness relieves her thirst followed by a warmth that radiates from her belly out to her limbs. Flexing her muscles, she feels that the fatigue that once gripped her body is now gone. Seeing the surprise on her face, Mr. Adoy tells her, Try again. Laona approaches the boulder once again and pushes. This time, the weight of the stone responds to her will, rolling out of the way and allowing water to flow into the Wow, Master Adoy, that rock seemed lighter than the first time I moved it. Truly amazing. Ingenuity inspired by imagination. Where is Corbat? You have both worked so hard, I wish to make you dinner. Actually, I'm not sure. He took a break shortly after we started, but he never returned. What? You did this all on your own? Please, come inside and cool off. As they approach the house, they are frozen in their tracks to the sound of growling and snarling. With surprise in his eyes, Mr. Adoy presses one finger against his lips and then mouths the word bear. He quietly approaches the door and then flings it open with his walking stick raised over his head, only to find the boy asleep at the table with the pitchers of lemonade and tea empty and strewn. With a crooked smile, Mr. Adoy interrupts Corbat's growling slumber, shouting, Bear! Startled away, Corbat <gasps> falls out of his chair and onto the floor. Ha <laughs> ha! Corbat, you hit the ground harder than the rocks I moved. Boy, what has earned you the right to drain my pitchers and eat my cakes, leaving no refreshment for us? I'm sorry, the day was hot and I was thirsty. Besides, I got up so early this morning that I had to skip breakfast. A warrior should have the courtesy to put others before himself. Pointing at Luna, he explains, She has completed the garden by herself and strengthened her body in the process while you slept. I'm stronger than her anyway. Maybe now she can challenge me. A true warrior must have the modesty to know that, however strong, one can always become stronger. Come, let me show you. With the children in tow, the master stops at the cart to grab a ball and then leads them around the house to a platform made of square stones arranged in a checkerboard pattern. Yesterday, I noticed the two of you playing a game. Please, show me how it's done. Corbat snatches the ball from the old man and turns to face Laona. I'm the best in the village. Let me show you. The idea is to try to get the ball past your opponent. They get one bounce before they have to return it. Unexpectedly, he hurls the ball at Laona, who quickly brings up her hand to defend herself. She catches the ball and throws it back. Corbat slaps the ball before it bounces, sending it swiftly to Laona's right. Her feet respond more quickly than she had expected. Diving to the ball, she hits it just a second before it bounces, landing hard on her side. While she pushes herself to her feet, Corbat runs to the ball and kicks it high over Launa's head. He laughs as he sees her scrambling to her feet, but then she jumps. 
Her legs' newfound strength launches her high into the air to swat the ball. She hits it with such force that it whizzes right past Corbat's head. Turning to catch it, it bounces off the tips of his fingers and rolls out of the stone square. Ha ha! I beat you! I beat you! I beat you! I can't believe I beat you! Some champion you are! I'm the best in the village now! Ha ha ha! Laona, you dance like a monkey crazy on soured berries! What did you win, young lady? A bag of gold or a sweet treat? Do not boast, for did he not win yesterday? Instead, congratulate him on a job well done. In fact, I believe that I am the winner for witnessing such an exciting game. The master strokes his beard and gazes out to the field, pondering the work of the day. The field is clear, so I will honor my word to train you. Now let us go back inside so I can prepare you a meal and you can reflect on the day's lesson. Returning to the house, the children sat with the master and ate a huge meal, which they washed down with ox milk and honey. The children returned to the village before dark, said their farewells, and went home. Both were too excited to sleep that night.